this time on The Gadget Show. Ooh. With Halloween just around the corner, Otis and I join forces for a very spooky <laughs> challenge. Can we use a range of cutting-edge tech and gadgetry to create a spookily haunted castle to scare the living bejeebas out of a rather jumpy celebrity guest? <gasps> what the hell was that? Also in this show, John joins forces with uber-talented singer-songwriter Jamie Cullum to find out if the new iPod is the best multifunction music player you can spend your money on. And as well as that, I'll be taking the controls to show you the Gadget Show's top five flying remote control toys. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, with Halloween just around the corner, we've decided to have a bit of a spooky theme to today's show. Mm -hmm. And we've spent no money at all, no, we've no expense spared, on props all around the studio, like this fantastic witch's cauldron, modelled on an actual one in Susie's house. Uh, this pretend replica actual human skull uh, with smoke in it. We've got pumpkins, we've got cobwebs, the Grim Reaper. This guy's pretty cool, check him out. Oh, yeah. How about that? Top effects, Suze. Top effects. Yeah, and in this week's challenge, taken on by Otis and myself, it's all about combining tech with terror. Yeah. So, trick or treat, Suze. Hmm? Mm. You give me a treat, or I play a trick on you. Oh, I know what trick or treat is, but I obviously haven't got any treats, have I? Good. You'll have to be a trick, then. You're not going to do a trick. That's what John said earlier. Wake up, Bentley! Hey. <laughs> <Aye>. Ah! <laughs> oh! <laughs> For the start of our challenge, Otis and I had been asked to meet in Piccadilly Circus at the heart of London's West End. We're in town yeah. and we're waiting for our challenge. What do you think it'll have? I something think it's something to do with traffic because it's so busy. Or maybe tourism. That's, <laughs> that's a good roof, isn't it? Well, I know what death looks like. So it's a do with death. I hope not. Susie and Otis, your task this week will be frighteningly challenging. With Halloween just around the corner, you must learn everything there is to know about the art of scaring people before using tech to create the scariest haunted house you can, where you must successfully spook an unsuspecting celebrity. That's really good, isn't it? Yeah! <laughs> Stupid fool. In the days before tech, scaring people was all a bit, well, basic. And let's face it, not all that scary. But these days, it's all a bit more sophisticated. The art of horror is now a multi-billion pound industry and millions are spent on research into how to give people a right good fright. Horror computer games like Dead Space, Resident Evil and Silent Hill have taken the techniques of creating suspense and delivering a shock to whole new scary levels. Yeah, that's all very well for the virtual world, isn't it? But we've got to physically create a scary environment to scare the bejeebas out of our poor unsuspecting celebrity. Luckily for us, the traditional haunted house hasn't escaped the technological revolution either, with its modern equivalents now boasting a cutting-edge horror experience, employing the very latest techniques to scare you silly. One of the most high-tech, new-age haunted houses is Passage del Terror, and it was here that we'd find out about the art of techno-scareology. Otis was going to experience the sheer terror inside, well, I would be watching over him with top TV psychologist, Dr. Jeff Beatty, to see exactly how and why Otis would jump out of his skin. To check just how stressed he'd get, Otis was fitted with a heart rate monitor to record his pulse during the ordeal. And as soon as Otis entered, a series of terrifying noises were triggered, which, I think it's fair to say, had Otis a little worried. No, 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 no. Keep going! Keep going! Already the fear response will start to kick in, and of course the fear response produces big physiological changes, which affects what you can see, affects all of your senses. Incredibly, Otis's heart rate had already leapt from 65 to 120 beats per minute. Now, Jeff, the next room for me is the most terrifying. It reminds me of a movie from the 70s, The Exorcist, with the girl that's possessed on the bed. And it's set up fantastically. It's terrifying. And it's all controlled by pneumatic compression. So the bed's moving, the drawers are moving, the window is moving. I hate this movie! I hate this movie! No, 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 no! No, no! <laughs> the green flashing lights and amplified screams <laughs> only added to Otis's panic. He looks really confused. He looks very confused. The point about green light 
terrible <gasps> negative emotional connotations. He's terrifying. You can see him actually terrifying running out of this here. room. His heart rate had now peaked at a staggering 140 beats per minute. As if Otis wasn't already totally spooked, next up, he came face to face with a ghostly apparition. Clever lighting and a two-way mirror allowed a shadowy silhouette to be projected over a skeleton. Oh, wow! Transfixed by the effect and full of adrenaline, Otis was caught off guard when the silhouette came to life. I can take any more, to be completely honest with you, man. But his journey wasn't over. In fact, it was about to get much worse. <laughs> the next bit of tech was about to be triggered. In this room here, there's a motion sensor. In a minute, he's going to walk through it. The motion sensing photoelectric cell was connected to the sound system. As Otis staggered through its invisible beam, it sounded like a pack of dogs had been released. <laughs> <laughs> With his dignity now in tatters, Otis clung Don't desperately like to the camera. I don't like it. Where are we going? Where are the lights? He's using the cameraman as a shield, and that's an attempt to kind of self-soothe. It's our way of dealing with negative emotion. But in the end, the cameraman's protection just wasn't enough for Otis, and he fled. Poor Otis. There wasn't one part of that that I liked. Not one. Look at me, look, look. And that's not because it's hot in there. I hate you. Forever, from, now, from now and forevermore. That was horrible. I take it all back, it did look terrifying. Feel that? You don't need a monitor. It's pounding. Oh, <laughs> my God, get out of your system. Your eyes were like stalk. You're on stalk. OK, let me, let me just... No, despite knowing the fact that there were 15 <laughs> actors in there, he came out and he was covered in sweat. But having someone jump out at you when you're not expecting it, yeah, that's scary, OK? And that's... Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's here all for comedy okay, I'm being effect. silly, mate. <laughs> oh! <laughs> How oh difficult do you think it's God. going to be for Otis and I to make our own scary haunted yeah. house using cutting-edge tech? Stick around oh to find out. God. Oh, Otis! I, for one, can't wait to see I that. You're unbelievable. It really is worth sticking around to see just how scared our celebrity gets when confronted by a castle full of tech. And also still to come, John gets together with the brilliant Jamie Cullen to test the latest incarnation of the most popular MP3 player ever. Should you buy the new iPod Nano? Find out after the break. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about MP3 players and the latest incarnation of the iPod Nano, the fifth generation of the best-selling MP3 player ever in the history of everything. Like its predecessors, it's small and sleek and carries the usual classic interface, but the cherry on the cake this time is the number of additional features. With an FM radio, a pedometer and even a video camera, it truly is a convergent bit of kit. But is it now a jack of all trades and master of none? Well, to find out, I've been testing it against two other MP3 players that also boast more talents than just playing music. And to get to grips with my three contenders, I called on the help of multi-talented musician Jamie Cullum. With five albums under his belt and a tech fan to boot, he was very well placed to assist me. So, Jamie, I'd be very interested to know what you think of these. They're all MP3 players with extra features. Right. Starting with the new Nano. Right. This fifth-generation model comes with 8 or 16 gigabytes and is the smallest of our three players. You have to put a radio on it at last. Is that important? That is... Actually, do you know what? That's a really big, big deal for me, cos I love listening to the radio. I love the way the tuning is like an old radio. That, that's really cool. It was FM only and reception was quite patchy, but its extra features were impressive. You can't record the radio, but you can use live pause, so you can actually stop. If you oh, like the, like the digital radio? Yeah, you just sort of hit the pause button. So the then does it store it on the hard drive for a little bit, or...? Up to 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> 
the big thing Apple are launching with this is they've actually put video into it. It's got a video camera. Not only can you play videos back, you can actually shoot some. And shoot some we did. <laughs> The picture quality is tolerable with a 640 by 480 pixel resolution, but the sound is poor. I think it's great for little memories and mm. it's good. And I assume you can take still photos on it as well. No, you can't. You can't? No, it's video only. Video only? That surprises me, actually, I must mm. say. Next up, the iRiver B30, which comes in 8 or 16 gigabyte models. And while it has no camera, it does have radio. Now, this one not only has FM radio, it also has DAB radio. Wow. There's a tiny aerial in the top, which you have to pull out. Doesn't seem to be getting any reception on the DAB. It's right outside. Yeah, it's there. Sounds wow. great. Sounds really good. While the DAB radio reception left quite a bit to be desired, Jamie wasn't put off. It's actually something that would really make me want to have this, actually. So, what about our third contestant, the Mint Pad? This 4 gigabyte player has no radio, but could it make up for it elsewhere? It's like a vision of the future from 40 years ago, <laughs> this something like that. That's what it kind of reminds me of. It includes a memo writer, a text reader and Wi-Fi browsing. Though as it exchanges data via the MintPad server in Korea, it's not always effective. So, so it actually has a video camera and a stills camera. Right. Shall we try oh, those? OK, yes, let's try yes. that. See how it stands up to the nano. The 1.3 megapixel stills were fairly decent, but the video was a different story. <laughs> It's like video used to be on old mobile phones when it first came out. I think mm. the resolution's really low, there's not really a lot of great colour, but it's OK. So, Jamie was charmed by the iRiver's radio. But what about ease of use? To test that out, I devised a devilish test of dexterity. Right, Jamie, in order to test how easy these three are to use, I'd like to run through the basic functions on each player. So, for each one, I'd like to find a track, press play, turn up the volume, and then navigate to the next track. OK, I can do that. Mm, but all while playing a tune on the piano with your other hand. Right. First up, the Nano. Go. The Nano's click wheel was intuitive, but hard to use with pinpoint precision. Ah, uh, harder than I thought. There we go. Hey, oh. and 22 seconds. The iRiver allows you to change tracks by shaking it, but its sensitivity resulted in so many false starts that we turned that function off. <laughs> OK, go. And then it was a breeze. There we go, next track. Wow, 19 seconds. 19 seconds. Finally, the mint pad. Ready? And go. The mint pad uses a swiping motion to jump from one level of the menu to another. It was a little fiddly. Done it. Oi, 21 seconds. 21 seconds. Okay, well, that wasn't bad. So the iRiver had come out top of this test, but we still had one important question to answer, which sounded best. And we'd got a fail-safe benchmark, the real thing. Right, take it away, chaps. Hello, Edison. Jamie and his band recorded a special version of his new track to set the standard. It was then converted into a high-quality MP3 and loaded onto each player. Well, now for the final and arguably most important test, sound quality. Yes. And we'll start with the Nano. I'll be very interested to see if there's that much of a difference. I can't imagine there will be, but we'll see. Though it seems like we've been friends for years And I felt ashamed Hearing it through good quality studio speakers like this, I'm surprised at how kind of trashy it sounds. There's not a lot of definition. It's fine, but it's, it's definitely not great. Well, let's see if the iRiver sounds better. OK. That sounds immediately better. You've got much more of a sense of stereo. Mm. You can pick out the instruments. I would say the sound quality of that is 50, 60% better. Do you agree? Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yes, right. Probably even more so. I mean, it's, it's, you it's you look like you were expecting it, actually. Yeah, yeah, I I'm, was. I'm yeah. totally surprised. The I River was leading, but could the Mint Pad redeem itself? Yeah, I mean that's very, very different again. It's very flat, very bass heavy, and the piano sounds like it's in the next room under a mattress. But which was Jamie's favourite? I would probably go with the I River. Actually, I'm really surprised I'm saying that. So, G ratings, and it's a lonely 1G for the mint pad. It's an intriguing idea, and it does lots of things, but it does most of them rather badly. And it's 3Gs for the Nano. It's as attractive as ever, but its features can't make up for mediocre sound quality. And the iRiver just scrapes 4Gs. It's by no means perfect, but it sounds brilliant, and that makes it the clear winner in this test. 
Right, now we want your help to find the Gadget Show's Gadget of the Decade. Yeah, at the end of this series, in a special show, we'll be looking back over the most important decade in the history of gadgetry and choosing our Gadget of the Decade, the outstanding bit of technology that has defined the last ten years. We want you to go to our website at 5.tv slash gadget show and vote for your favourite in five different categories. Best phone of the decade. Best music gadget of the decade. Best entertainment gadget of the decade. Best photography gadget of the decade. Best computing gadget of the decade. And then finally, we want you to make your choice for the big prize, the overall gadget of the decade. So go on, get online and make sure your favourite gets chosen. Right now, it's time for the Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, we choose two iconic gadgets from a particular category. And then choose just one to join the growing ranks of gadget royalty on our Wall of Fame. And this week, it's a battle of the robot toys. It's Robo Sapien versus Ibo. Imagine having a pet dog that never stopped to peer for lamppost, or that never got too old to learn new tricks. Well, there's no need to imagine. He's already here, and he's robotic. The beautiful and brilliant Sony Ibo. In the early 1990s, Sony wanted to combine the huge advances that had been made in computer processing, artificial intelligence, voice recognition and visual technology to produce a friendly robot that could interact with and learn from its human owner. Unfortunately, though, their initial designs were charmless. After some major design tweaks, though, they came up with Ibo. A word created from AI, artificial intelligence, and the BO from robot. Granted, not a great start. But in May 1999, 3,000 Ibos went on sale in Japan at the price of £2,000 each. Within 20 minutes, they'd sold out, and Ibo instantly became an international phenomenon. With built-in cameras and sound sensors, Ibo could recognise faces and voices, so you could teach him a trick or two. Let's dance. Sony regularly launched new iBOs. Altogether, they sold 160,000. But in 2006, Sony ended their AI program and production stopped. Oh, look at him, John. <gasps> he's so cute. And he's packed full of tech. And he's possibly the most important high tech toy ever made. And he needs a home on the Wall of Fame. You know, you want to. You'll be a good boy, won't you? Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Nice try, Suze, but as you know, Ibo has gone to that great robotic puppy pound in the sky, which is just as well, because he could never have competed with the true master of the toy robotics universe. I am, of course, talking about Robo Sapien. Created in 2004 by NASA scientist Mark Tilden and produced by Wowie Toys, Robo Sapien sold for just £62 and was the first affordable intelligent humanoid robot. I love Robo Sapien because he looks like you want a toy robot to look. Look at him, a bipedal robot straight out of a science fiction film. He also moves really fluidly. Look at that. He comes with this fabulous remote control. It's got uh, 21 buttons and a whole bunch of pre-programmed functions, like his burp functions. Check it out. He can also do a high five. And one of three kung fu moves at a time. There you see. If little Ibo was there, Suze, Robo Sapien would deal with him. Within two years, he evolved into Robo Sapien V2. He was now 188 pounds, but he spoke 160 pre recorded phrases gimme, gimme, gimme. and had an articulated waist and shoulders to help with his moves. RSV2 has improved hand and feet sensors, infrared vision, and audio sensors, so when he hears things, he can actually move towards or away from them, a little bit like Terminator. He just will not stop. The incredible success of Robo Sapien has led to other highly successful Wary products like Robo Raptor and Robo Pet, as well as Spider Sapien and Homer Sapien versions. And next year, he's set to star in his own CGI live action movie. Since 2004, over 7 million Robo Sapiens have been sold worldwide. Understood. He's already an icon, a classic the toy robot that everyone knows. And long after Susie's dog thingy has been forgotten, Robo Sapien will live on. 
both lovingly told fascinating stories. But you can't escape the question, Susie, the Ibo. I know it's very innovative, very clever, but it can't be that brilliant. They've stopped making it. It is brilliant. And this is not the wall of sales, after all. This is the wall of fame. This is iconic, the most beautiful high-tech toy ever made. And it won hearts and minds. And Jason, Robo Sapien, I know it's very popular, but isn't it just a toy? And dare one say it's actually a toy you might get bored with quite quickly, actually. Um, possibly, you know, adults would. But the market for Robo Sapien, remember, is ordinary people, young children, uh, who can afford this kind of technology because it's mass-produced, it's made of inexpensive materials all over the world, over 7 million of them, in mm. fact. And for them, for the youngsters, the experience of playing with Robo Sapien is, isn't boring at all. It's actually very real. Yeah, so it's really, we've got the very popular versus the very clever and innovative. Ooh, tricky, tricky, tricky. It's close. Or is it that close, actually? I'm not sure it is. I think there is a clear winner. And for me, the winner is... Ivo! Yay! Because it's just so much more than a toy. It really is clever and innovative. It deserves a place in, in an art gallery, in a science museum, and indeed, on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. What do you think? Right, time for another short break now, but after that... I'm in my element when I test the top five remote control flying toys you can buy. And our Halloween challenge continues as Otis and I use tech to scare the pants off an unsuspecting celebrity. Oh Jesus my Christ. God! Welcome back. It's time for this week's top five, and as you might have guessed, it's remote control flying toys, a subject close to my heart. I've got to be honest with you, there's little I like to do more on a weekend than spend a few hours throwing a piece of cheap plastic with a couple of motors attached to it up into the air and then smack it against my ceiling and walls. We love radio-controlled gadgets on The Gadget Show so much that last year we set the Guinness World Record for the fastest nitro-powered radio-controlled model car. 85! Oh. 85! 85. But today we're shooting for the stars as we try and find our top five indoor flying toys. Look at that thing, it's beautiful. They're just brilliant fun, and there are dozens of different models to choose from for less than 50 quid. Everything from flying dinosaurs to astronauts, and of course, absolutely loads of helicopters. They all work in fundamentally the same way. You've got a transmitter, which is what I've got in my hands here, and then on board the flying object, whatever it is, in this case it's a helicopter, you've got a receiver. Some of them, though, have some little fancy features. And that's where the difficulty comes in. So my first test is ease of use. Once they're charged up, all these toys should be ready to fly straight out of the box. And most of them did just that. Yeah, look at that. Oh, it's great. I love this. Straight away, it's really stable. But some didn't seem to understand the whole business of defying gravity. Oh, dear. I'm kind of understanding why they died out right now. My next test was reliability, because the last thing you want is motors that keep cutting out or toys that fail to survive a crash landing. No, it's completely useless. Too flimsy. Finally, my favourite and most important test. Are they any fun? Look at the sound girl's hair. You could do a fashion shoot with this thing. So, after much soul-searching, here's my top five. At number five, it's the iFairy. It's part of the Wingmaster Ornithopter series, which all have a fairy convincing flapping wing movement. Yeah, it works really well. But of the three models in this range that I tested, the iFairy was the most stable and the most fun. Wow, so good. At number four, it's the V22 Osprey. Based on Boeing's vertical takeoff plane, this has two sets of horizontal rotors which allow it to take off vertically just like a helicopter. Yeah, I love the rolling star. Each pair of rotors are counterbalanced to create a gyroscopic effect so that you get really steady movement. Isn't it cool? At three, it's the Blade 3D helicopter. At 700 grams and over 37 centimetres long, you'll need a pretty big room to fly it in, but it's got very precise controls which let you manoeuvre it through 360 degrees, which is great, whether you're indoors or out. At two, it's my favourite of the Salvation series, the Salvation 9. 
It's got a three-channel controller, which means you can fly it in three directions, up and down, left and right, and backwards and forwards. Plus, it's got a hover trimming tab, which makes it incredibly accurate. It's as stable in flight as a, a, a larger model costing hundreds and hundreds of pounds. But at number one, it's the incredibly brilliant Heli Mission. Toys don't come much cooler than this RC SWAT truck with its own micro helicopter. Fantastic. It's just superb. It's just genius. I love it. The dual RC controller is easy to use. The truck and copter are tough and work perfectly. So you've got literally double the fun of anything else out there. Just genius. Yeah! Oh, oh. oh hey! Yes. Aren't these fantastic? Oh, they're just brilliant. And amazing presents because they're so affordable. Yeah, very I'm pleased that you chose my number one as well. I knew you'd like this one. So land it. All right, come on. Because we've got a very important announcement to make. We have. Yes. You're right. Extremely important announcement. Um, stop whatever you're doing. Look carefully into your television screens. Yeah, everyone's doing that. Over to you, Suze. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited and privileged to announce the dates for next year's Gadget Show Live exhibition at the NEC in Birmingham. It's the 8th to the 11th of April 2010. Sorry. Yeah, you sort of stole off. No, I did. I, do, do, do it again. There's plenty of time. The 8th to the 11th of April 2010. Yeah, no, you're right, I did steal your thunder. It wasn't the same the second time. Last year, Gadget Show Live was a massive success, and the feedback we got from those of you who came along was brilliant. But the show sold out weeks before it opened, so this year we've made it a whole lot bigger to try and ensure that every single one of you who wants to come along can. The exhibition will double in size and fill four halls stuffed full of the very latest tech and special features including a future tech zone, a gadget test track and a gaming zone. The Gadget Show web TV team will be there posting hourly reports from the show and of course, you mustn't forget the 4,000-seater Gadget Show Super Theatre where you can come and see me, Jason, John and Otis perform a very special version of The Gadget Show just for you. Jason, ready for the wind? I've got the wind. Nothing new there, then. We'd love to see as many of you as possible at the show. And so for more information, please log on to our website at 5.tv slash gadget show. Right, now we're going to give you the chance to be the first person to get tickets for Gadget Show Live. Yeah, because in this week's competition, we're giving away six tickets to Gadget Show Live, plus tickets to the Super Theatre, plus a chauffeur-driven limo to pick you up from your house, take you to the NEC, hang around while you spend loads of money on gadgets, and then take you back home again. Oh, yeah, but if you win the competition, you won't have to spend loads of money on gadgets because we are giving away pretty much every gadget we think that you will need to make your own mini gadget exhibition. Yeah, check this out. 100 gadgets. Here's the list. Listen carefully. As well as six tickets to Gadget Show Live, plus VIP tickets to the Super Theatre Show, plus a chauffeur-driven limo to pick you up from your house, bring you to the show and take you home again, you could win an iRiver MP3 player, a Helimission RC toy, a Panasonic compact digital camera, a Nikon D90 SLR and a 50-inch plasma TV. A 32-inch LCD TV, a 22-inch LCD TV, a Blu-ray player and 20 Blu-ray movies, a high-end desktop gaming PC and a MacBook laptop. The Acer Aspire Revo nettop, a Canon Pixmar printer, a Wii, a Wii Fit, DSi and an Xbox 360. A PS3, a PSP Go, a Pyramat gaming chair and a whole lot of games for all the consoles. A swap watch and a pair of Salomon walking boots. A Garmin 4 and a sports watch, an Apple iPod Touch, an Arcos 5 media player, a 5.1 surround sound speaker system, a pair of Denon headphones and a Sonos music system. A high-def Panasonic camcorder, a Sony reader, a Rovio mobile webcam, a loaded Dervish longboard, a bulletproof USB memory stick and an Oral-B Triumph electric toothbrush. A Tonium portable DJ system, a Slingbox Pro, a Marin mountain bike, a pair of Skull Candy headphones, FX Home special effects software, and a Berghaus Bioflex rucksack. A Magimix food processor, and a Yogi Gatekeeper Pico, a Flip Video Ultra, and a Griffin Bluetooth headset, a Power 8 Workshop, a Brompton folding bike. A GoPed Noped, a Pocket Surfer, a Philips webcam, a Cobb Barbecue, a Philips juicer, and a Wolf Eye Shark Torch. A Flatlight, a Dyson Ball Vacuum, a Sony Digital Photo Frame, an Aladdin Challenger Flask, and an Aero Stuff Fury Kite. It's a prize fund worth in excess of 16 grand.
hand. And to be with the chance of winning the lot, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Who starred as Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs? Was it A, Anthony Hopkins, B, Brad Pitt, or C, Kevin Spacey? To enter, call 0904 1616 or text A, B or C to 63555. Or send your answer, name and contact number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 13, PO Box 46556, London N10 0WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday, the 2nd of November and two days later for postal entries. Of course, we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. Time now to return to this week's haunting challenge. <laughs> Yes, you'll probably remember earlier, I terrified Otis by making him go through the Passage del Terror, all in the name of research. Yeah, and, and the research showed us two fundamental things, yeah. Yeah, that, that you can actually create a genuinely scary environment using the right kind of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And also that, of course, Otis is a complete girl's blouse. Oh, please, you'd both have been scared in there as well. Anyway, uh, research completed, Susie and I then had to create our very own haunted house. <laughs> Yeah. The setting for our celeb spooking would be the super eerie 11th century haunted castle in Tamworth. But right from the start, I wanted to make sure that this time round, I would be safe and sound in the control room. Now listen, before we do any planning, I went through Passage del Terror. I only think it's fair that you do the tour. Yeah, in the real castle. Yes. With the real ghosty ghoulies. Yes. Um, OK, all right, I don't mind doing that. Yeah. I'm brave. So, with our roles defined, we bravely headed off to look through the castle's rabbit warren of creepy-looking rooms that are said to be haunted by the ghost of a white lady. These are the haunted stairs. These oh. actually are called the haunted stairs. So we had the perfect location, but now we needed to fill it with some clever tech, inspired by what I'd calmly researched earlier in London. But because we wanted our celebrity guests to believe they really were in a haunted castle, our tech would have to be somewhat more subtle and less in your face. So our first gadget is going in this room, and it's going to be this massive subwoofer, which is going to be incredible. It's going to emit a low frequency, which is going to resonate through your body and make me and our celebrity feel very uncomfortable. In order to operate the speakers and all our other spooky tech at exactly the right moment, we'd got in some home automation experts. As Susie and I installed the ghostly gadgets, they wired it all to a central computer server. So I could control everything wirelessly using their software on a tablet PC. We'd learned that one way to scare people is to get inside their mind and change their perception of reality. And we had a very clever and very subtle bit of tech to do that. Right, in here, we've created an electromagnetic field. Look behind this bench. See that? Massive coil. That's emitting 12 hertz of frequency, which is kind of similar to your brain frequency, which makes you perceive things differently. Exactly. Now, you can see what it's kicking out here. And the bonus is the equipment that you're going to have, your yep. ghost hunting equipment, My detects reader. changes in the electromagnetic field. So it's going to go nuts when you go into this room. Perfect. Come on, next room. Now, the last time I was in someone else's bedroom, I wasn't made to feel very welcome. But in ours, I'd hopefully be the one creating the uncomfortable atmosphere. Now, then, when people experience paranormal activity, they often say that the temperature in the room drops, don't they? And that's what we're going to do in here. We've got a silent air system hooked up to these tubes here. Cold air is going to come in, bounce off the ceiling, and because it's cold air, it has to hit the floor. So it's literally going to send a shiver down their spines. Ooh, do that again. Not as nice as that. Mm. The reason why it would be so quiet is because the cooling unit was set up outside along a balcony. The cooled air was then pumped through these insulated tubes into the room. One of the scariest and most unexpected moments of my experience in London came as a result of me triggering a motion sensor. Stop, 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 stop. It was a concept we just had to use in the castle. Now then, in this room, this is going to be really great, because look down there, that's an infrared motion sensor. So when we walk through and break the beam... These lights are going to start flickering eerily. 
Cool. And the great <laughs> thing about it is, come and have a look over here, because Otis's control centre is over there, and with his little tablet, he's going to be able to further the scariness by making them flicker even more. Ooh! And it was also at the window that our guests would see our last techie trick. Inspired by the two-way mirror effect I'd seen, we'd created our very own ethereal apparition. With a piece of glass placed at 45 degrees to our TV screen, we could reflect a creepy, ghostly, homemade video through the window. <laughs> With everything set, we simply had to tidy the place up and wait for our celebrity to arrive so we could scare them witless. Perfect. <laughs> Whoa. So, what did you think of our ideas, then? I love them. I love the silent air concept. Oh, well, that's supposed to make the temperature of the room drop by 10 degrees in a couple of seconds, and all quietly. Yeah, can you imagine that? Just... Oh. But will it work? <laughs> exactly. How scary will our high-tech, scary castle really be? Yeah, how scared will our mystery celebrity be? <gasps> Find out after the break. And you join us for the final part of this week's haunting challenge. I just want to do a little experiment. Uh, Otis, do you find this digital radio <laughs> scary? <laughs> no. So there are some things that don't actually terrify you. Yeah, okay, thanks good. very much. No, Jason. I just wanted to check. <laughs> <laughs> so, Susie and I had rigged up Tamworth Castle with all manner of gadget based trickery, and we were ready to give a mystery celeb a Halloween. To remember. <laughs> 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 oh! As darkness fell across the land and the midnight hour was close at hand, Otis and I were ready to do some scaring. OK, so our celebrity is almost here, so we've got to get to our stations. Susie, yes. it's very important that you react convincingly I to all our tricks. I want you to scream like you don't know what's going on. Scream like I don't know what's going on. Mm. You've got to do your best on the controls. Mm -hmm. Don't make any noise. Don't get you traipsing around with those heavy feet of yours. Traipsing? Traipsing? Susie, I have the feet of a dancer. I'm smooth and light. What, light on your feet? Yeah. Hmm. As I retreated upstairs, our mystery guest arrived downstairs. Singer... Hello. Liz McLarnon. She thought she was here to test some ghost hunting gadgets with me. And as ghost expert Richard Felix explained the tech we'd be using, it became clear that Liz was already petrified. Let's start with this. This is a thermometer, right? If yeah. you suddenly say to me, oh, my God, the temperature's dropped okay. in here, right, we've only got your word for it. Yeah. But this will actually tell you. You heard people say, oh, my God, the temperature yeah. dropped and then yeah. this figure appeared. Because that's what happens. So you get a drop in the temperature in the room, God forbid something may be happening later. Oh. Then we have uh, what's called an EMF meter. Oh, yes. Um, if there is some form of energy in the room, an energy source other than us, there is a possibility that this will go off. If it goes up to something like halfway up there, yeah. and you're in the middle of the room... In the yellow ..or zone. something like that, then you've got problems. Something's actually coming very close to you. Oh! The machine. oh but God. do remember, there are various parts of the building that are extremely haunted. There's a, a, a bedroom that's extremely haunted, oh, called no. the cook bedroom, where um, a lady actually lost two children in, in, within a year. She's supposed to still be there. After Richard had finished his frankly chilling presentation and we'd familiarised ourselves with the tech Liz thought that we were here to test... How are you feeling? ..it was time to enter the castle. So, so scared. Little step here, look. Oh, OK. Meanwhile, upstairs, I was ready in my control room. Just one minute into our ghost hunt and Liz was already a nervous wreck. Oh, what's that noise? Can you hear that banging? And we hadn't even got near any of our tech yet. Then, as we approached the bedroom where we'd hidden our subwoofer, she almost bottled it completely. Oh, Susie, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm... Oh, honestly, I'm so scared. That is a, that is a, a figure in the corner, isn't it? It's just, it's just, it's just uh, you know, a mannequin. Can... Yeah. Oh, honestly, Tom, I'm so scared. Finally, Liz was in the room, and that was my signal to remotely trigger our ultra-low frequency sound waves. Silence, everybody. Let's have a bit of quiet. Instantly, the atmosphere in the room changed. Can you hear that? You can go on. Though we couldn't properly hear anything, we could feel the sound in our bones, and it was very uncomfortable. Liz was now rigid with fear. Someone take me down, please. Honest, I'm dead serious. 
Of course, I ignored her pleas and pressed on, straight into the next rigged up room, the one where we'd hidden the massive electric coil. Oh! It sent my EMF meter wild. Just sit on here. No, no. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! And for Liz, that meant just one thing. There was something in the room with us. I'm too scared, honestly. What did he say? Did he say Richard if it went yellow? Ironically, in her efforts to escape, Liz ran straight to the scariest room in the castle. The bedroom that Richard had told us was haunted by the ghost of a grieving mother. I am not going in that room. I'm not I know I've seen the pictures in that room. I'm not going in that room. This was where we'd concealed our silent air conditioning system to create the drop in temperature often associated with paranormal activity. But I wasn't going to switch it on until Susie had persuaded Liz to enter the room. It's warm in here. Come in, come and bring your temperature gauge in here. Look. And right on cue, the temperature just suddenly dropped. Oh, it's gone really cold, actually. It's getting cold out. It's getting really cold. Yeah, it's getting cold. Our laser thermometer recorded a rapid fall of 10 degrees. <gasps> oh my god, it's so it's like a draft, but it's not a draft, it's so soft. But yeah. it's freezing. Oh, come on, let's go. That was ex absolutely extraordinary. Finally, with her nerves in tatters, I led Liz towards the final room and hopefully our biggest shock. They should be walking past a motion sensor at the moment, infrared motion sensor, which will set the lights off. <gasps> Oh my God, what the hell was that? What was that? It really was a scary moment, and Liz was now trying to hide behind her ghost hunting gadgets. Well, I'm scared. I'm super really scared, yeah. Oh no, let's just go. Come on, please. Honestly, I'm so, so, so scared by things. She really wanted to leave by now, but we had one last shock waiting for her. Before Liz left the room, I had to dash downstairs and set up our ghostly apparition. And right on cue, Liz spotted something. What is that? There was something so supernatural and creepy about the face. It seemed to hover inexplicably in the room opposite. Liz was horrified. It's moving. <gasps> oh my is God! It's moving. Is it me? No, no, it's no, not. Our ghost was truly frightening, and Liz couldn't take any more. Okay, let's go. Which way? Downstairs. That was my cue. It was time to rush downstairs and reveal the truth. Oh, oh, hey, oh. Liz, what did you see? Oh. What did you see? Was it you? There? No, no, oh. not at all. What did you see? What, lots and lots of things. <laughs> like what? Could they have possibly been gadgets that did it to you? Oh, wicked! <laughs> oh, yeah! Oh, I love that more than anything! <laughs> Beautiful. That worked a treat. <laughs> Wasn't she a great subject? Oh, yes. I have to say, she was a really good sport. So, for me, uh, my favourite remains the silent air. I think it's fantastic. And the speed with which the temperature drops and her obvious reaction saying, yeah. it's really weird, <laughs> it's, like a, it's sort of soft and... <laughs> she was like this with the thermometer at one point, with her right, eyes yeah. shut, going, yeah. it's really cold, it's dead cold in here. Yeah, it, it was hilarious. But I also like the hologram, because it's the sort of thing that anyone can make really easily, and it, it seemed to have the desired effect. Yeah. And I must say that it was pitch black in there, which is yeah. why the night vision cameras worked so well. But you were glad that you were in the control room, yeah. not going hey, to hey, that, was, that was the only genuinely haunted part of the castle. Oh, I can't yeah. believe that the control room still managed to scare you. <laughs> anyway, on that note, that's it for this week's uh, Gadget Show. We'll see you next time. See you, see you soon. Next time. <laughs> next time on The Gadget Show. Jason and I are challenged to design and build a gadget for pets. Woo! But will our innovations have them begging for more? It's brilliant! Or bolting for the cat flap? <laughs> Otis meets up in the woods with ex-Special Forces hard man Mike Hawk <laughs> to test the top five pocket tools on the market. And John tries out the online photo printing services available and finds out which is best.